Good morning. And good morning also to those of you watching at home or on the DVD. We're glad that all of you could join us this morning to be in the Lord's house and receive his blessings. Before we get started, I want to apologize, first of all, for any distracting limping that I might be doing up here. Uh, your pastor's an old man, but he still thinks he's a young man sometimes and does young man things like play hockey against his son. I don't know how to stop, so that was a problem for me, and I ended up hurting my leg a little bit. So anyway, for, forgive me for limping around up here. It'll be gone, hopefully, by next week. As you can see in the bulletin, there aren't very many announcements, and all of them have been uh, made before. There's only one other kind of new announcement that I will bring to your attention, and that is that Lent is starting in a couple of weeks on Wednesday, February 17th. That will be our Ash Wednesday uh, gathering. Uh, we will once again have the imposition of ashes that day, and, and so uh, my invitation to you, if you desire it, is you could come earlier before you go to, to work that day and receive ashes and wear them throughout the day. Uh, otherwise, we will receive them if you want to. To, uh, during the service that evening. Uh, the theme for Lent this year is going to be the six chief parts of the Catechism. Uh, so each week will be a different part of the Catechism. Um, kind of a neat thing. I've never done anything like that before. I'm kind of excited to see how God will bless us as we work our way through uh, His Word, really. Are there any announcements that you have that should be made today? If not, then let's go ahead and begin our worship. Our liturgy is the service of morning prayer, and we begin with our opening hymn, Awake My Soul and With the Sun. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. O Lord, open my lips, Amen. and my mouth will declare your praise. Give glory to our God, our light, and our life. O come, let us worship him. O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. 
Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hand formed the dry land. O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Give glory to God, our light and our life. O crown, let us worship. We now sing, Create in me a clean heart. today comes from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18. Moses spoke to the people and said these words, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen, just as you desired of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, or see this great fire any more lest I die. And the Lord said to me, They are right in what they have spoken. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers, and I will put my words in his mouth, and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And whoever will not listen to my words that he shall speak in my name, I myself will require it of him. But the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name that I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of other gods, that same prophet shall die. O Lord, have mercy on us. Our epistle reading for today comes from Paul's letter to the Christians in Corinth, his first letter, chapter 8. Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Therefore, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and that there is no God but one. For although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many so-called gods and many lords, Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all, all try that again, through whom are all things, and through whom we exist. However, not all possess this knowledge, but some, through former association with idols, eat food as really offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not commend us to God. We are no worse off, off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this right of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone sees you who have eating, who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will he not be encouraged, if his conscience is weak, to eat food offered to idols? 
And so by your knowledge, this weak person is destroyed, the brother for whom Christ died. Thus, sinning against your brothers and wounding their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. O Lord, have mercy on us. Thanks be to God. We rise now for the reading of the gospel. Today's gospel reading is taken from Mark chapter 1, and these words serve as the basis for today's message. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority, and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit. And he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice, came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. In many and various ways, God spoke to his people of old by the prophets. But now in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. You may be seated. Our hymn of the day is, O Word of God Incarnate. On the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority. And they were all amazed, saying, He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. This is our text. The movie The Exorcist came out a long time ago, back in 1973. 
For those of you who haven't seen it, it's the story about a young girl who was possessed by demons. And when the priests came and tried to cast those demons out, they had a heck of a time doing it. At that time, the movie was considered pretty scary. But what most people don't know, and what might have made it even more scary, is that the movie was based on a true story. Did you know that? Now granted, the movie that you might have seen is the Hollywood version of it, but it was a true story. It was about a boy from an LCMS congregation near Baltimore, Maryland, back in the 1940s. And in that boy's confirmation class, the pastor took note of some strange goings-on around the boy. And eventually he had to call the parents and break the bad news to them and tell them that he thought their son was possessed by demons. Now, I'm not going to go into all the details now about how that all played out, but suffice to say, it was quite an ordeal to finally get the demon out of that boy. These days, we really only hear about demon possession when we see it in the movies. But it's still a real thing, and all kinds of people are currently possessed. Sometimes the demons might be willing to make their presence publicly known, and, and let their mastery over a person be seen. But most of the time, the demons in America prefer to keep it a secret. At least in America, that's the case. I've talked with missionaries from other lands where the demons are much less careful about concealing their identity. One of the missionaries told me that he saw demons all the time. That seems to be how it also was during Jesus' time on earth. Now, some people think that the reason why the demons were so active at that time was because of the incarnation of Christ, as God not only entered into time and space, but even and also into humanity itself. That, that's possible. I don't know. There could be other reasons. But whatever the reasons may have been, it's clear that demons were a commonly accepted reality in the ancient world. And various archaeological discoveries have proven that fact time and time again. In fact, there are even medical journals from that time that included ways to combat unclean spirits and defeat them. In those journals, it was said that the most effective way to drive out a demon was to appeal to an authority that's even higher than that of the demon. And that brings us to Jesus in today's Gospel reading. When he cast the demon out of the man, what did he say? Did he say, in the name of the living God, I command you to come out? No. He just said, be silent and come out of him. Notice that Jesus didn't have to appeal to any kind of higher power. And why was that? Well, you know why. It's because he himself was the highest of all powers. He is God. Therefore, when he says something to creation, it must obey him. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Jesus said, be silent and come out of him, and the demon did. Clearly, Jesus was a man with authority. And Jesus demonstrated that authority, not just in how he cast out demons, but also in how he proclaimed God's word. Prior to casting out the demon, Jesus had been teaching in the synagogue. But the way that he taught was different from how the scribes did it. That's because when the scribes taught, they always made reference to some rabbi uh, from the past, some well-respected teacher, or they referred to a Jewish council that had already addressed that particular text and rendered some sort of judgment on it. In other words, when the scribes taught the people, they didn't rely on their own authority to speak and apply God's word. Instead, they pointed the people to others whom they considered authoritative so that the people might believe their teachings and apply it to their lives. But that's not how Jesus taught the people. When he spoke, he didn't cite other rabbis or councils. He simply said, thus says the Lord, and let God's word be his own. That's why it's so funny when the Pharisees attacked Jesus for healing on the Sabbath. As you know, the Jews had laws against working on the Sabbath. Now, for some people, performing a miracle on any day of the week might be considered a lot of work, but not for Jesus. 
For him, it wasn't any work at all. He simply spoke the word, and it came to be. He'd say, be healed, and they were. So miracles were never work <clears throat> for anyone who had the power and authority to do them. And Jesus had both. And because he did, he could do more than just advise the people on what they should believe and how they should live. He could compel them by the power of the Holy Spirit to believe his words and then do what he commanded. That's why he could tell his disciples and others to follow him, and they did. That kind of authority and power can only be exercised by God or by those prophets whom God has sent to speak in his name. And again, Jesus was both. He was both God and at the same time sent by God. And so in today's text, Jesus shows himself to be more than just a good teacher with authority. He was the true and mighty prophet, the one that Moses said God would one day send. <clears throat> He was the one who would speak God's word and exercise God's own authority. And he would be like his brothers in every way, except for one. Jesus would be without sin. In today's Old Testament reading, that promise for Moses was good news for the people of Israel. Notice again what Moses said at the end of his proclamation. He said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him that you shall listen. Just as you desired of the Lord when you said, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord, lest I die. In those last words of what Moses said, we see why this was such good news for the people of Israel. They were terrified of God, and with good reason. They were sinfully rebellious and had continually committed egregious offenses against him. And because they knew that God was just, they also knew that he wasn't happy with them, and that someday he was going to punish them for their iniquities. That's why Moses was so important for them. He was the mediator who stood between them and God. When God wanted to wipe out the Israelites as their sins deserved, Moses protected them by reminding God of the covenant promises that he had made to them, and then he demanded that God keep his word. In fact, there was even one time when Moses offered to suffer the punishment that God threatened against Israel. He was going to suffer himself so that they wouldn't suffer it and they, that they wouldn't be cut off from God. His willingness to stand before the wrath of God and turn it away didn't just make Moses a great prophet. It made him the greatest prophet of the Old Testament. But in today's Old Testament reading, he promised that another prophet, an even greater prophet, was coming. And he would have God's own word in his mouth, and his hands would perform all of the miracles that only God himself could do. But in addition to all of that, the prophet would also be a perfect mediator, the one that God's people longed for. That's what would make him the greatest prophet of all time, because he would stand between the sins of the world and the punishment of a just and holy God. He would be the one to use his power and authority to defend those who don't deserve it and to rescue those who were enslaved by sin. He would turn the wrath of God away by offering himself as a substitute sacrifice. And as you know very well, that's just what Jesus did. With the fullness of his divine authority, he declared from the cross, it is finished. The whole purpose for God sending him to the earth had been accomplished. Man no longer needed to fear God's judgment or his terrifying, majestic presence. That's because everything that had made us God's enemies had been destroyed in and by Christ. Through his blood, peace with God 
was established. Such that God is no longer our judge. Instead, he is our father and our friend and an ever-present help in the day of trouble. Gone is the terror which caused man to grovel before him with uncertainty and dread. Now we can approach him with confidence, eagerness, and even joy. And when we do, we can do it knowing that we're climbing into the lap of the most loving father ever. And now when our age-old enemies, the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh, when they try to attack us, we are not defeated by them or separated from our loving God. For his prophet, the Holy One of God, has exercised our enemies, casting them out and rendering them powerless against us. They may still attack us, but they cannot overpower us. That's because they've already been defeated. They were cast out of us forever on the day when our great mediator put his own name upon us. You see, demon possession is real. And at one time, you were possessed by them. But then Christ came and rescued you through the waters of holy baptism. With the words spoken over you at that time, he cast out the evil one and all his darkness and corruption. When the pastor made the sign of the cross, both upon your forehead and upon your heart, Christ marked you as his own. And unless you renounce the, his grace through unrepentant sin and unbelief, that's what you will always be, his own. Jesus is the greatest prophet of all time because he had the authority and the power of God. Because he is God. And as God, his word creates reality. He says it, and it is. Well, he has declared that your sins are forgiven. That everything that separated you from God has been cast out and destroyed. Therefore, as Moses encouraged the people of his day to do, so I say to you now, listen to that prophet and believe him. My dear brothers and sisters in Christ, in baptism, God has spoken to you and declared to you that by his grace through faith, you are now and will always be his child. He has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous and everlasting light. So now, when the demons of our world come around, seeking to sow seeds of doubt or trying to get you to rebel against your gracious Father, you need not fear them or heed them. Simply remind them who you are. Say to them, I am a baptized child of God. Your false accusations and your empty lies have no place in my life. Therefore, be silent and be gone. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you now to please rise as we join together in speaking responsively the canticle on page four. <clears throat> Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and redeemed them. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior, born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets, he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies, from the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham, to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us, to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet in the way of peace. 
Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. We continue now with the prayers. Almighty God, because you know that we are set among so many and great dangers, that by reason of the weakness of our fallen nature we cannot always stand upright, Grant us your strength and protection to support us in all dangers and carry us through all temptations. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God and Father, we thank you for sending Jesus to be the great prophet for us and a merciful mediator. Now that he has proclaimed your true word, defeated our enemies, and defended us from the wrath we deserved, Grant us a strong faith to continually listen to him, trust him, and believe the promises that he has fulfilled for us, and then rest eternally in his grace. Lord Jesus Christ, because you are a faithful mediator for us, we come to you and seek your blessings for those who are in need of your help and healing. Grant restoration, strength, and comfort to all who are struggling with afflictions of the body, mind, or soul especially Beth, Elizabeth, Ruth, Belwyn, Amy, Michelle, Gus, Stephen, Heather, Trevor, Rebecca, Melody, Rosemary, Madeline, Giselle, Linda, Lydia, Jim, Peggy, Roger, Sarah, Kellen, Paul, Denny, Orlin, Darlene, Jim, Tom, and Jack, and all those that we lift up to you now silently in our hearts. O Lord, we also ask you to have mercy on Linda and her family as they mourn the passing of Donna, her mother. May your peace, which surpasses all our understanding, keep their hearts and minds hopeful in the promise of your resurrection. By your grace, through their faith, may they have a future reunion to look forward to. Holy Spirit, through the waters of baptism, you did, you did indeed call us out of darkness and into the marvelous light of God's love. We especially give you thanks for the adoption by faith of those who celebrate their baptismal birthdays this week, including John. Thank you for working through the water and the word to clothe all of us with Christ's righteousness and to bestow on us eternal life. Hear our prayers, O Lord, for, the, for your name's sake and for the good of our neighbors. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by your governance, may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The almighty and merciful Lord, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, bless and preserve you. Amen. You may be seated for the singing of our closing hymn, Hail to the Lord's Anointed. (laughs) 